We're now in the midst of talking about component spaces, which is the idea that all kinds of vectors can be represented by sets of numbers. How is that done? It's always done in the same way, by choosing a basis and decomposing all the vectors in the vector space with respect to that basis, and then taking the resultant components and organizing them in columns like this, making them elements in Rn, in this case R2. Well, in this way, all vector spaces are equivalent to Rn. And in the last video, I gave three overwhelmingly convincing reasons for using component spaces. But I also mentioned that component spaces are overdone, that they're often used when they shouldn't be used. In this video, I'll explain what I meant by that. I will also explain why until now, but no longer, we've been advocating against drawing a connection between geometric vectors and sets of numbers or any other kinds of vectors and sets of numbers. And I even made a passionate appeal about treating all objects on their own terms. And we've stuck to that until now. For example, when we talked about geometric vectors, we only talked about geometric sorts of things. We talked about their lengths and angles and geometric sorts of things you can do to these vectors, like rotation and translation and projection and reflection and so forth. And we never identified geometric vectors with sets of numbers. Conversely, when we talked about vectors from Rn, sets of numbers, all we did was talk about their entries and the sorts of things you can do to their entries. For instance, maybe swap their entries or multiply an entry by a number or add a multiple of one entry to another and so forth. In particular, we never mentioned that the length of this vector is square root of 5. In fact, our position remains that vectors from our end don't have a length. Geometric vectors have a length that you can measure with a tape measure, but not these vectors. These are just sets of numbers, and the concept of length so far makes no, se no sense for objects like this. Well, that's been until now. Going forward, we're inviting you to draw a connection between geometric vectors and sets of numbers, and in fact, all sorts of vectors and sets of numbers. Well, these approaches are actually consistent, and I'll explain why they're consistent. And the gist of the explanation will be that there is time and place for component spaces. So more so than in other videos, the points that I'm making in this one are not so much a matter of fact as there are a matter of one's perspective on linear algebra. And that probably makes this video more important than the more factual videos. In any case, you are already familiar with what my perspective on linear algebra is. I see linear algebra as a subject that simultaneously studies very diverse kinds of objects. And it does so by extracting what those very different kinds of objects have in common. And those are the things that make them vectors. And there are only two things that all vectors fundamentally have in common. It's their ability to be added together and their ability to be multiplied by a number. That's it. Those are the only two things that make different objects vectors. Everything else is what makes them different. So we focus on what the objects have in common while acknowledging what makes the objects different. So we must take advantage of the commonality while celebrating the diversity. That's what linear algebra is, and so that's the way it should be taught. And after all, you're studying linear algebra, probably not because you want to study sets of numbers for the rest of your life. You're studying it because you're interested in velocity fields and forces and currents and audio signals and images and stresses and strains and so forth. In other words, you're studying linear algebra because you're a mathematician or a physicist or a mechanical engineer, or a civil engineer, or an electrical engineer, or an architectural engineer, and so forth. Or maybe you're a computer scientist. You're studying this subject because it has something to say about the objects that interest you. So why delay talking about the kinds of objects that interest you until later? So that's why we've been talking about audio signals and geometric vectors that represent velocities and forces and so forth, and all other kinds of objects from day one because that's our perspective on linear algebra, and it's this perspective that has largely shaped the development of this course.
but that's just one approach to linear algebra. There are other perfectly legitimate ways of approaching the subject. And I'll just mention one more approach, that of my mentor Gilbert Strang. And I think it would be fair to say that many of his scientific discoveries happened to a large extent because of his love and profound understanding of linear algebra. So I'll now try to summarize what I think his approach to teaching linear algebra is. And if my description is inaccurate, I'm sure he'll let me know. But I think he'd say something like this. Let's start with and concentrate on Rn from day one. After all, it is a very clean and beautiful space. And we all understand Rn pretty well because after all, it's just sets of numbers. And it's also capable of illustrating just about all of the fundamental concepts of linear algebra without any compromises. Furthermore, Rn comes tailor-made for the powerful algorithms of linear algebra because most of those are stated in terms of numbers and columns and matrices, in other words, in terms of sets of numbers. And it also comes tailor-made for computer implementation. So there are all of these advantages to just concentrating on Rn. And whenever possible, whenever helpful, we'll use the geometric analogy to illustrate the concepts that arise in linear algebra by using this standard connection between geometric vectors and sets of numbers. But beyond that, let's not be distracted by other kinds of vectors. Then later, after we've mastered linear algebra in the context of Rn, we can look towards other objects and realize that in some important ways, they behave just like elements of Rn. And therefore, just about all of the concepts that we learned in linear algebra can be extended to other kinds of objects. And therefore, the subject of linear algebra can later be generalized to other subjects. Now, that's a perfectly legitimate approach that has proven to be quite successful over time. It's just not my approach. Of course, my approach, while different, doesn't contradict this approach. And it's nice to have more than one approach to any particular subject. And I think it's very nice to be able to hear more than one voice when studying a subject. All right, so now let me talk about the wrong ways of invoking component spaces. Let's first recall how the connection between geometric vectors and Rn is typically made. Well, it's typically made by introducing a Cartesian coordinate system. Let me draw it here very carefully, like this. And actually, coordinate systems is a little bit of a calculus term. Let's use the linear algebra term of introducing a basis. And I will use yellow chalk to draw in the basis. So this connection between geometric vectors and sets of numbers is usually made by introducing a Cartesian basis. Cartesian basis in geometric terms means that we're using two vectors that are unit length and orthogonal to each other. And continuing with linear algebra terminology, the components of this vector with respect to this basis are two and one. And so this vector is equivalent to the vector two one in R2. And we usually say that this vector, I don't usually say it, but it's usually said that this vector is the vector two one. And sometimes it's denoted like this, two one. That's the vector two one. So that's how this connection is typically drawn. And there are two things wrong with this. There are two crimes that are being committed. Crime number one is actually choosing a basis in the first place when it may be unnecessary. Look, we're now on video number approximately 200. And until now, we have not needed component spaces. And that was partially our way of celebrating the diversity of the kinds of objects that linear algebra talks about. That was our way of treating all objects on their, term, on their own terms. And it was our way of paving the way for you to use linear algebra in your respective fields and apply it to the kinds of objects you're interested in. So it has not been necessary to introduce component spaces. So we haven't done it until now. And you might say, well, what's the harm of introducing coordinate spaces even if you only need them later? Well, from my point of view, the harm can be quite considerable because I think that understanding in mathematics really means clarity and simplicity. And if you introduce an additional 
somewhat unnecessary concept too early on, it may take away from the simplicity and it may take away from the clarity and ultimately preclude understanding. So I think that it can be quite harmful from the point of view of understanding mathematics. And also quite frequently, my students come to me and they're confused about the problem in their respective fields. And very frequently, the confusion actually comes from introducing a coordinate system unnecessarily. And when you do that, you convert all of your meaningful objects to sets of numbers. And you forget about your meaningful objects. And you forget about the problem that you're studying. And all you're left with is rather dry sets of numbers. And when you're left with nothing but sets of numbers, you've lost your intuition. You've lost your geometric and physical intuition. And you're forgetting what this object means. So you're at a loss for ideas for what to do with these objects and what some intermediate results might mean, what their geometric or physical interpretation is. So it's led to confusion. And this happens very frequently. So the first common crime that we have avoided until now was invoking component spaces, which means introducing a basis in linear algebra or a coordinate system in calculus when it's completely unnecessary. And when doing so, obscures the very clear and simple geometric or physical picture of the problem you're working on. So that's crime number one. So-called crime number two has to do with the choice of basis. So you've come to a problem where you need a component space to move on with your calculations, to make further impact on your problem. But for some reason, you a priori choose Cartesian coordinates or a Cartesian basis. Well, cho choosing a basis, the choice of basis, should always be dictated by the problem you're trying to solve and not some a priori notion as to what basis is better than the rest. All bases are created equal, we'll say it more than one time, all bases are created equal until the problem you're solving helps you choose a basis. The problem you're solving should dictate the choice of basis. But all too often, and especially it's this Cartesian basis that dominates all other choices for no reason whatsoever. I think if you open nine out of 10 books on physics or even applied mathematics or engineering on page one or two, you will see this picture and you will be operating in the context of the Cartesian basis. And it's typically the wrong choice. Well, quite frequently choosing a basis in the first place is the wrong thing to do. But if you do have to invoke component spaces, don't always go for this basis. This basis is rarely the best basis. And when you do choose the wrong basis, bad things happen. Among them is being faced with impenetrable computational difficulties. The wrong basis often leads to completely impenetrable calculations. And many researchers give up on the problems they're solving thereafter and retreat in the face of impenetrable computational difficulties. And it is often because of the wrong choice of basis. Another thing that might happen, just as detrimental, is when you look at your intermediate calculations, you will usually find a mixture of two things in those calculations, in those intermediate results. You will see some features of the problem you're working on, but you will also see artifacts of your special coordinate system. And you will not know which is which. And you will not know how to proceed because you're not sure of what your intermediate results are telling you because they are obscured by your choice of basis. And you may not be able to have any ideas on how to proceed. And you are also deprived of opportunities to look for errors in inter intermediate results because they're typically so complex that you're not sure whether you're looking at a feature that tells you something about the problem you're trying to solve or the special or artifact of the special coordinate system that you selected. So these are two, unfortunately, very commonplace wrong reasons for invoking coordinate systems and bases and component spaces. So we have not needed them until now, but we have now developed the need for component spaces. One of our examples was dilation, where without the component space, we were unable to determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we will now begin using component spaces
but we'll do it right. We will not use component spaces unless it's necessary. And we will treat all bases as equal until the particular problem that we're trying to solve will dictate the choice of the bases. So the component spaces are here to stay. We will work with them. We will use them, but we'll do it right.